Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to uh, welcome uh, one and all for joining us this morning. Uh, as soon as we have 11 uh, members present, uh, we're going to um, have a short business meeting. Uh, some of you know, Senator Capito uh, knows as well. The uh, government printing office apparently made a mistake uh, after we had passed out and uh, reported out our water uh, infrastructure legislation two weeks ago. And as a result, we need to simply uh, do again what we did two weeks ago, and that's to report out uh, those bills. And I hope we'll do that uh, in short order uh, once we have 11, and then we'll get back to our, uh, our business that's, that's before us to, uh, today. Um, I'm going to start, uh, until we have 11, I'm going to start uh, with a, a, a statement and, uh, and ask, invite uh, Senator Capito to do that as well. And if we have 11 people appear magically, we'll break and, and do the vote. Today's hearing is uh, special for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is because it has the longest title I've ever seen in 20 years in the United States Senate. The title is Long-Term Solvency of the Highway Trust Fund, Lessons Learned from the Service Transportation System Funding Alternatives Program, and Other User-Based Revenue Solutions, and How Funding Uncertainty Affects the Highway Programs. That's it. That's probably the longest acronym. There's probably a great acronym in there somewhere, probably several of them, Senator Capito. But I'm not going to take our time to figure out what it is. Um, I want to thank uh, Senator Capito. I want to thank uh, her staff, our staff, and all of you uh, for um, uh, help us, helping us put together today's uh, hearing. And we especially want to uh, welcome our, vis uh, our witnesses, some of whom are here in person and some who are joining us uh, virtually. I, uh, uh, Senator Capito and I uh, have been informed that our, our, H, our water uh, legislation and I want to thank again uh, Senators Capito, Lummis, um, oh gosh, Cardin, Wicker, others who uh, helped to work uh, make that legislation possible for us. We put it out unanimously two weeks ago. My thanks to all of you who supported it. Uh, and uh, we are informed by our leadership that uh, that legislation very likely will be on the floor. Uh, pardon? Do we have 11? Oh, that's great. All right. And in that case, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, hold off for a moment on my statement. And uh, my staff informs we now have a majority. My ranking member tells me we have, uh, we have the number that we need and we're physically present and able to vote. Therefore, the Senate now considers S914, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021. First, we'll adopt the bipartisan carpet capital amendment number one, just as we did last month. I move to adopt the carpet uh, capital substitute amendment Senator Capito and I have agreed to do this by voice vote. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Um, I now move uh, that the committee report S914, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021, is amended. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. I now ask unanimous consent that the business meeting record reflect that S914 as amended was reported by the same 20 to zero vote as when the committee acted on March 24th, 2021. And I further ask that our staff be allowed to make any necessary tactical and conforming changes to this measure. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. So now we'll return to our hearing. And Mary Francis, thank you for helping me get through that landmine field. All right. Uh, so I, mentioned, I was just mentioning longest uh, title I've ever seen in, in a piece of legislation, frankly, one of the most timely and I think interesting uh, uh, hearings that we're going to have in uh, some time. Um, uh, I, I mentioned we uh, hope and expect to have our uh, water uh, legislation out on the floor uh, a week from now, and uh, I think we're going to have a vote today um, on, uh, on another nominee out of our committee, the nomination of Brenda Mallory who uh, came out of committee on bipartisan vote. And uh, she's been nominated to be the chair of uh, CEQ. And uh, I uh, understand that somebody told me earlier today that uh, 13 past CEO and uh, EPA appointees, 13 past Republican CEO and EPA appointees, including a former CEQ chair and four different Republican EPA administrators, 
publicly praised and urged her confirmation. They include uh, Bill Riley, Christine Todd Whitman, Michael Levitt, Steve Johnson, and James Kavanaugh. And uh, she's also been endorsed by, uh, I think since last we met, by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So I would ask that you all keep that in mind when, when we vote later to, to today. I, um, uh, when I was new in the Senate, uh, I, some of us uh, I knew uh, when I got here. Uh, Jim Menhoff and I served together in the House. Um, a couple of others had served to, uh, we do it like uh, Chuck Schumer and I, Dick Durbin and I. Uh, a number of us have served together. And one of the people I didn't, and one of the main things I decided early to do in, this, in the Senate is to, for the folks I never met, didn't serve with in the House, didn't serve with as governor, I decided to spend, just to go have a cup of coffee with them in their offices. And so I'd ask one after the other, after the other, and make my rounds. And one of the last people I, I asked this was a guy who sat right behind me on the Senate floor. His name's Ted Kennedy. And uh, I told him what I was doing, getting to know people I didn't know. And he said, why don't you come to my hideaway? We'll have lunch together. And I said, really? And he said, yes. Two weeks later, we were on his highway. We had lunch together. And one of the things I asked him, uh, Ben, was I said, why is it that all these Republicans, why does all these Republicans want to be your co-sponsor on your, uh, their big bills? Why is that? And he said these words. He said, I'm always willing to compromise on policy, never willing to compromise on principle. Think about it. Always willing to compromise on policy, never willing to compromise on principle. So I want to start this hearing thinking about um, uh, we're going to have to compromise on service transportation legislation as we go along with our colleagues on the committee and in the Senate and in the House and with the administration. But there's some principle I hope we can agree on that uh, we won't go uh, very far, uh, far away from. And one of those is that uh, uh, roads, highways, and bridges in this country are in bad shape. Uh, something needs to be done about it. And we are uh, among the most responsible people for making that happen. The second principle is that climate change is real. We need to combat it. We need to adapt to it. We need to build back better. We need to focus on resilience with all the extreme weather that we're facing. The third principle would be the things that are worth having are worth paying for. Some people describe me as a recovering governor. I'm also a recovering state treasurer. It was a treasurer of the state with the worst credit rating in the country when I was 29 years old. And, uh, I have uh, always believed the things uh, that are worth having are worth paying for. And um, the last uh, principle I hope we can ad adhere to is those who uh, use our roads, our highways, our bridges have a responsibility to help pay for them. Now, there are in my state, and I'm not sure, but in your states, but in my states, there are a number of major pay fors for roads, highways, bridges uh, gas and diesel tax, uh, vehicle registration, sales taxes when people buy vehicles. Uh, driver's licenses. The 800-pound gorilla forever has been gas and diesel taxes for decades. And uh, But I would add to that the uh, times uh, are changing. And um, I uh, I don't think uh, Senator Sab when I was here yet, but uh, gosh, about a dozen or so years ago, she and I were at the Detroit Auto Show. She was kind enough to introduce me to Mary Barra, who was, I think, just about to become CEO of GM. And uh, the, uh, one of the GM products that, that year was selected, I think, as the car of the year. It was a Chevrolet Volt, V-O-L-T. Chevrolet Volt, interesting enough, a hybrid, um, got uh, 38 miles on a charge. 38 miles on a charge. And after that, you know, it's traditional hybrid, you're on gasoline. And, uh, but anyway, it was the car, car of, the, of the year. That was then, and I uh, went out uh, during recess while we were on break with uh, my oldest son, and we went out to buy a, a vehicle to replace my 2001 Chrysler Town & Country minivan, which has almost 600,000 miles on it. And I, uh, we drove, among other things, a Chevrolet Bolt. It gets uh, 300 miles on a charge. We also drove a Ford Mustang. It gets over 300 miles on a charge. Ford is about to put out an F-150 pickup truck, all electric, and uh, I thought I'd never see the day that we'd have an electric uh, F-150 truck, but it's a top-selling vehicle in the country, as you know. Uh, GM says uh, they're not going to be uh, uh, selling, building and selling any uh, gas and diesel powered vehicles after 2035. They're going to phase them out. Ford is expected to match or better that. Uh, Tesla, we drove some Teslas uh, during the break. One of them is a Y model. It gets 350 miles on a charge. Uh, there's another vehicle that, uh, that we that took a look at that gets over 400 miles on a charge. And uh, that's uh, it's not not everybody's into uh, electric. Uh, we've got um, folks at Toyota have a whole division of their uh, company that's uh, called uh, Morai. That's Japanese for future. 
and they are focused on fuel cells, fuel cells, hydrogen and fuel cells. The waste product that comes out of that combination is water that you, water that you can drink. Um, GM and uh, Honda are partnering up on fuel cells as well. And there's a South Korean uh, car company, Hyundai, apparently has a whole division of their company that focuses on fuel cells. They use hydrogen. And they're expected to use a lot of it in the years to come. Uh, gas and uh, diesel uh, revenues our traditional bread and butter for building roads, highways, bridges, maintaining them, are not going to dry up and go away overnight. Uh, we're told that the average uh, year number of years a uh, vehicle has on the road is about 15 uh, years. So we're going to be using gas and diesel for some time, but by less going forward. Uh, I think it was Stephen Stills, Buffalo Springfield, who once uh, sang, uh, something's happening here, just what it is ain't exactly here, clear. Uh, but uh, I think it's becoming clear what's going on. And we have the opportunity to get ahead of it or to get behind it. We need the trans craft to transportation uh, bill, service transportation bill that enables us to get in front of what's happening here. And uh, the question is what will uh, the next generation of vehicles, that are, will they be built here? Will they be designed here, manufactured here, sold here? Or will they be built other places around the world? Uh, will they help us in uh, the battle against the climate change or not? And uh, will we look uh, this adversity in the face of climate change and, and all? And uh, instead of just finding despair, find opportunity. And my hope is that we will find opportunity and it will seize the day. And part of that is figuring out how to uh, build the uh, service transportation system of the future in ways that affect resilience, uh, climate change, and our need to, to move ourselves and our goods uh, around the country in a cost-effective, cost effective, safe, and climate-friendly ways. So with that, I would ask unanimous consent that uh, my, uh, my written statement be, uh, be inserted for the record. Uh, I, I welcome everybody again. This is, a, uh, I think, an enormously important, enormously important uh, hearing, and will help us to see the future more clearly and be ready for it. Thank you. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing today and for your ongoing commitment to this bipartisan process for the Surface Transportation uh, Reauthorization Bill. Uh, I'd also like to thank our witnesses for joining us here today. We look forward to hearing from you regarding the current status of the Highway Trust Fund and recommendations for funding and financing solutions to address the national transportation infrastructure needs of our nation, uh, many of which our chairman just spoke about. Passing a bipartisan surface transportation reauthorization bill continues to be my top priority as the ranking member in this committee. Our committee has a strong record of developing these bills in a bipartisan manner, and we are in the process of coming together once again to develop a bill that includes input from both parties and the stakeholder community. From my perspective, this bill must enable long-term investment in our nation's roads and bridges, but do so in a fiscally responsible manner without partisan or lightning rod pay-fors that could sink a bipartisan bill. We need to give flexibility. I spent the last two weeks traveling my state, as many of us did, talking with our um, uh, road and uh, transportation sector and flexibility is absolutely critical to our states and communities to address their unique transportation needs. The flat areas of Oklahoma are nothing like the mountains of West Virginia. So if you're going to uh, try to put us both in the same bucket, it could, be, it, could, it, it could be very constraining. We need to keep the federal interest focused on providing a connected network of road and bridges to ensure that all communities and the economy can thrive, and also safety is critical in our bridges. We need to facilitate the efficient delivery of projects so that we can improve the safety and resiliency of our surface transportation system, and we need to drive innovation. Innovation is critical to help pave the way for the systems of the future. I'm willing to work on all of these with all of my colleagues to get these goals into our bills. We need to have that give and take of a bipartisan process to produce legislation that can make it to the president's desk. It will take work from all levels of government and the private sector to meet the nation's transportation infrastructure needs, and we will have to take an all-hands-on-deck approach. The Highway Trust Fund, which is the source of funding for federal surface transportation projects, is once again, as it has over the last several years, facing a, a shortfall. This shortfall must be addressed for us to move forward with the bill. 
We've got to work together here to find this bipartisan long-term solution for the trust fund shortfall. All of us who use our surface transportation system should contribute to its upkeep and expansion. And today that is not the case with all of the users. We should consider the unique impacts on certain Americans, including those in rural areas and lower income individuals. And we should try to minimize administrative and cost burdens. We should also try to provide states and other non-federal partners with options to use various financing tools. This is not an easy problem to solve. I'm willing to consider various solutions so that we can discuss how to pay for our nation's infrastructure. Since our committee last met, President Biden has, has proposed a type of pay that I have cautioned uh, against in, in the past. I am concerned about the effect that the tax increases proposed by the administration will have on our nation's growth, particularly coming out of this pandemic. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on an array of solutions and innovative approaches to raise revenue for the transportation needs across the nations that we can achieve together. I'm committed to working with all of my colleagues, across, both here in the committee and uh, in the Senate in general and across the Capitol and with the administration to see that we can get there where we need to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Senator Capito, thanks. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think now we'll have the opportunity to meet, or with, meet and greet our witnesses. And uh, uh, we're, we're blessed with this, uh, this the panel today. And I had a chance to meet in person a couple of the, uh, you here. So thank you to those who are here at, uh, today in person and those that are joining us virtually. We, we very much appreciate your participation. I want to thank our staffs, both on the minority and majority side, for bringing together an excellent uh, team of witnesses. Let me uh, start by, by introducing Joe Kyle. Uh, Mr. Kyle is the Director of Microeconomic Analysis at the Congressional Budget Office, CBO. Mr. Kyle, uh, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and please proceed uh, with your statement uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to today's hearing. I'll briefly touch on three points. First is the, the status of the Highway Trust Fund. Section, second is some options for spending on highways, and third is options for uh, generating revenues for the trust fund. For more than a decade, the government has been spending more each year from the highway trust fund than the revenues collected for it. Those revenues come mostly from taxes on gasoline and diesel fuel, as well as, well as various taxes on heavy trucks. CBO estimates that the balances in both the highway account and the transit account of the trust fund will be exhausted in 2022. The total shortfall over the next 10 years is projected to be $195 billion in CBO's baseline estimates. If the trust fund balances were to be exhausted, the federal government would not be able to make payments to states on, on a timely basis, and as a result, States would face challenges in planning for transportation projects because of uncertainty about the amount or timing of payments from the Treasury. Turning to spending, the federal government spent $47 billion on highways in 2019. Almost all of that was uh, through grants from the trust fund to state and local governments for capital projects, that is for building new roads and rebuilding existing ones. As you consider options for reauthorizing surface transportation, you face many choices about how much to spend. Let me illustrate just two of them. If you want to maintain the current services uh, and, and the current condition and performance of the highway system, the government would need to spend at least $55 billion per year over the next decade. Alternatively, if you want to fund all projects for which the benefits exceed the costs, the government would need to spend at least $71 billion per year. Of course, the amount of money spent uh, needed to generate those benefits would depend on the quality of the projects selected. Any increase in spending from the trust fund would, would require additional income to it. One approach would be to require users of the highway system to bear more of those costs. When people drive, they impose costs they do not pay for. Those costs include wear and tear on roads and bridges, delay from con traffic congestion, and the harmful effects of exhaust emissions. A combination of taxes on fuel and mileage that makes users pay for more of those costs would make use of the system more efficient. 
If you want to increase revenues by charging users of the system, you have various options. One option would be to increase the existing taxes on gasoline and diesel fuel. Those taxes have been unchanged since 1993. Increasing them by 15 cents per gallon, as an example, and then indexing them to inflation would raise $26 billion of revenue for the trust fund in the first year, and that amount would gradually increase over time. Another option uh, would be to impose new taxes on users of the system. For, for instance, the government could impose a, vehicle, a tax on vehicle miles traveled some states already have similar VMT taxes on commercial trucks. CBO recently found that each one cent per mile of federal tax would raise $2.6 billion per year if it was levied on all commercial trucks and all roads. It's important to note that implementing a new tax would require resolving several practical steps to assess and collect the tax, and implementing new taxes would probably be more costly to the government than increasing existing ones. Some approaches would also potentially raise privacy concerns, especially if they were applied to personal vehicles. New, demonstration pro uh, new approaches to tax, uh, taxing highways could be assessed through demonstration projects. Such projects could evaluate different approaches to key components of a tax. For instance, projects might apply uh, taxes differently depending on the type of vehicle or the type of road. They might apply taxes differently depending on uh, the time of day or the location of the travel, and they might assess or collect the tax in, a different, in different ways. An alternative to imposing the cost of increased spending on users would be to distribute those costs more broadly. Since 2008, the federal government has transferred over $150 billion from the general fund of the Treasury to the Highway Trust Fund. You could adopt that approach again. Compared with other options, such as increasing the gas tax, funding highways through broad-based taxes would have the advantage of imposing a smaller burden on low-income households relative to their income. I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. You've given us a lot to thought about, think about in a very short period of time. Our next uh, witness is Jack Basso. Jack, uh, nice to uh, see you up on the screen. Uh, chair of the Mileage Based User Fee Alliance, a nonprofit dealing with all aspects of mileage based user fees. Mr. Bas uh, Basso, uh, thanks for all your work over the years. It's great to have been able to work with you in many venues. Thank you for joining us today and your recognized present your testimony. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank members of the committee for holding this hearing on the subject of mileage-based user fees and the Highway Trust Fund alternatives. I am the chair of the board of the Mileage-Based User Fee Alliance. First, I want to recognize the recent proposal from the Biden administration giving priority to drastically increased infrastructure investment. There's a great need for action, we all agree, I think. In my testimony, I highlight the extent of the needs and look forward to finding ways to fund those needs using a variety of creditable sources. We at the Alliance have been working to provide education, research, understanding of new ways to collect revenue for surface transportation investment. Since 2008 has been mentioned, the revenue to the trust fund has dramatically fallen short. 13 years ago, Congress created two commissions to make recommendations as to alternatives to pay for trust-funded programs. They both concluded that mileage-based user fees would be one of the most uh, effective ways to do that. Uh, a total of 20 states over the past five years, with the assistance of the federal STAFA program, have launched major tests, a variety of pilots, designed to examine the feasibility of conducting mileage-based user fee tests and support the needs were conducted. A great deal of it has been learned from them. Let me just highlight a few. Uh, first of all, uh, the largest scale personalized public outreach effort in the country, 300,000 individuals and businesses was surveyed uh, in Hawaii and 15% of the Servants, uh, surveyors responded, yielding a wealth of data 
on public preferences for road user charges. Washington State allowed a year-long pilot of GPS and non-GPS alternatives and gathered a great deal of facts for the, uh, the participants. Oregon was the first program in the U.S. in six years to uh, go to expand its knowledge and interoperability of many of the items for existing programs. California advanced a 5,000 vehicle pilot uh, that expands the knowledge of rural, tribal, equ and equity concerns. Minnesota's pilot funding allows to demonstrate the use of broad technologies uh, in mobility areas. Uh, my submitted testimony includes additional information, but for the sake of time, I pulled these few samples. Dr. Henron will talk, I know, about the Eastern Coalition and their activities. I note that the U.S. alone uh, is not alone in moving to uh, mileage-based user fee. New Zealand, Germany, and Australia have been advancing programs and pilots of their own for that purpose. At this point, the next step to test the approach through a national pilot. We also strongly believe that additional funds should be made available to, for the state pilots, clearly to preserve the user pay principle and the need to make changes uh, in the system. Uh, and Bufa recognizes the urgency to develop and implement sustainable funding. Uh, and we stand by ready to be of assistance and help with a 50 state system pilot. The next step is to synthesize what the states have learned in order to identify the most promising alternatives uh, essential to the national system. America, as America expands its electric vehicle fleet, there's a need to be able to collect road user charges and the need will become self-evident. This is a, there is a question of equity and the pilots, all of them conclude analyses of equity issues and what might be done. Uh, the Alliance has provided the committee with a number of considerations that we believe will enhance such a national pilot. In conclusion, we wish to be supportive of the Congress in its efforts to advance investment in surface transportation infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basso. And now I would like to rec uh, recognize Dr. Hendren, Patricia Hendren, and uh, the Executive Director of the Eastern Transportation Council. Welcome to our committee, Dr. Hendren, and you're recognized. Please present your testimony. Thank you. So Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee, it is an honor to speak to you today about what we can bring, how we can bring a sustainable funding model to our transportation system. My name is Dr. Patricia Hendren, and I'm the Executive Director of the Eastern Transportation Coalition, a partnership of 17 states and Washington, D.C. For more than 25 years, the coalition has brought together transportation agencies to push innovation and bring solutions to the eastern seaboard. As part of the Surface Transportation System Funding Alternative Grant Program, we have been investigating the viability of a mileage-based usage fee, or MBUF. The cornerstone of the coalition's work is multi-state pilots, real-world data analysis, and connecting directly to the drivers to figure out the feasibility of replacing the fuel tax with a distance-based approach. We're talking about MBUF today because we have lost the connection between how much a driver uses the road and how much they pay for it. The concept of a user fee was introduced with Oregon State fuel tax in 1919. The premise was simple, the more you drove, the more fuel you purchased, and the more you contributed to roads and bridges. Over the last hundred years, our vehicles have changed dramatically, with vehicles going farther on less fuel and some vehicles using no fuel at all. Though this has been great for our wallets and the environment, the long-term sustainability of the fuel tax is in jeopardy. Our work, as well as pilots and programs around the country, have shown that a mileage-based user fee is a viable alternative. The coalition has conducted five demonstration pilots, three multi-state passenger pilots, a multi-state truck pilot, and a national truck pilot. We have taken the study of user fees from theory to practice to show how MBUF would function in an actual operating environment and how a fuel tax could transition to MBUF over time. Our research shows that an MBUF implementation strategy must address four key elements. 
First, public education. By and large, the public does not realize that we are facing a transportation funding problem. About two-thirds of people we surveyed thought funding was increasing or staying the same, while in fact it is decreasing. To start a conversation about transportation funding with the public, our work has shown is essential to first connect quality of life benefits, such as safe route to schools, work, and recreation, to a strong transportation system. To move forward with a new sustainable funding approach, we're looking for federal leadership on a national education campaign to expand knowledge about the importance of transportation and the need for change. Second, privacy. In all of our pilots, participants expressed early concerns about privacy. However, these concerns fell significantly over the course of the pilot as people experienced MBUF firsthand. For example, in our recent passenger vehicle pilot, participants who ranked privacy as a high concern dropped from 49% down to 15%. Our findings, which are consistent with pilots performed around the country, highlight the value of continuing state and multi-state pilots as a mean to address the public's very real privacy concerns. Third, our nation is made of urban, suburban, and vast rural areas. To understand what a shift to MBUF would mean for different communities, we conducted an in-depth analysis using state data that showed rural drivers will generally pay slightly less with MBUF than they currently do under the fuel tax. In other words, rural drivers often fare better with MBUF. So a key aspect of MBUF exploration needs to be the expansion of this type of analysis to better understand how a change in how we fund transportation would impact individual households as well as different socioeconomic groups. Finally, the motor carrier industry. As heavy users and payers, truckers must be included in any transportation funding exploration. Our national multi-state truck pilots brought truckers directly into the MBUF conversation and showed that using the same MBUF approach for cars and trucks, or even the same approach for all trucks, can end up penalizing fuel-efficient trucks and lead to other unintended consequences. A viable MBUF system must reflect the complexity of the trucking industry and understand that trucks are not big cars. We believe any future transportation funding model must address all users and build on the work done to date with the trucking industry. In conclusion, changing from 100-year-old fuel tax system to something new will not be easy. At the coalition, we've designed our multi-state work to show how MBUF affects actual drivers across a variety of real-world environments and to bring forward insights about how MBUF would work on a national scale. All the work that we have done has been made possible by the grant program that this committee had the wisdom to create as part of the FAST Act. Thank you for your leadership. Continuing to work together, I am confident that we can find a permanent solution that sustainably funds our highways and bridges and keeps our country moving and thriving. Thank you. Dr. Hendren, thank you very much. And now uh, we're gonna turn to Robert Poole of the Reason Foundation. Mr. Poole, please proceed with your testimony uh, when you're ready. Mr. Poole. Thank you, thank you, Chairman, Chairman uh, Carper, you're uh, Ranking Member uh, Capito. Are you hearing me? Oh, yeah, loud and clear. Very good, thank you. And, and members, thanks very much for inviting me uh, today. I have been doing transportation policy research for more than three decades and have served on a number of committees of the Transportation Research Board. Uh, one of the most important of those was in 2005, was the first serious national look at the long-term viability of fuel taxes and our report published in 2006 concluded that they would not be sustainable uh, for the 21st century. Uh, about five years later, Congress, uh, as, as uh, I think Jack Basso mentioned, appointed the Infrastructure Financing Commission. My colleague at Reason, Adrian Moore, served on that. And it clearly, after evaluating about 15 alternatives, concluded that charging per uh, mile driven rather than per gallon consumed was the most viable alternative going forward. My testimony, I suggest four ideas for dealing with the sustainability of the of the trust fund. First of all, uh, I suggest the Congressional Research Service suggested in a very recent uh, bulletin, uh, one short a short term fix for the trust fund would be to restore the original user pays users benefit principle that started, as, as Dr. Hendren mentioned, with Oregon's first gas tax in 1919, and that is to uh, uh, make the put all the money raised from highway users 
toward the highway program. That would almost cover uh, the amount that's currently being spent each year on the highways. That would, of course, mean shifting the non-highway programs to the general fund uh, and doing doing this openly rather than in to, you know, through subterfuge, in effect, of finding general fund money and putting it into the trust fund and then taking it out again. Uh, avoid the, the middleman and, and do it straightforwardly, which, which reflects the large general fund commitments planned in the administration's American Jobs Plan. Um, my second point is that uh, uh, many needed transportation mega project, projects billion dollar scale or more, uh, are not going to be accommodated by a short term fix to the trust fund, nor uh, in the administration's plan. There's just simply not enough money there to rebuild the interstate highways and replace uh, many of the major billion dollar scale bridges that, that need replacement. Uh, so th there's an alternate way to bring in uh, private capital, which could be very, very important for these kinds of projects specifically. Uh, the interstate highway reconstruction that was called for in the big TRB report that Congress asked for estimated a trillion dollars over the next 20 years. I think that estimate is low, both in terms of cost and in time frame. But a lot of those projects really need to be done. And uh, uh, pension funds uh, and other institutional investors would love to invest in long term revenue generating infrastructure. And so uh, Congress could open the door, as I suggested in a recent Wall Street Journal piece, to this kind of private investment by making two changes with virtually no budgetary impact. <clears throat> One would be to expand the current tax exempt private activity bond program, which has exhausted its $15 billion original cap, uh, make that much larger. And secondly, make sure that the language makes it clear that these uh, can be financing not only new capacity, which was the focus of the original program, but to fix existing infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt and modernized. That's not at all clear in the current legislative language and that needs to be made clear. The other change would be to expand a small federal pilot program that allows only three states to each rebuild one interstate using toll finance. Uh, there's a number of states that are really studying this. The Congress could, could expand that to all 50 states and allow any state that chooses to participate to rebuild all their interstates, which would make much better sense than simply singling out one, which would be politically very difficult. Um, third, I certainly agree with the need. Uh, Reason Foundation is a charter founding member of the Mileage Based User Fee Alliance. Uh, I second the comments that, that uh, our previous uh, witnesses have made about the need for more uh, pilot projects, uh, uh, and uh, particularly multi-state uh, uh, pilot project and more projects getting involved, long haul truckers, uh, which travel interstate. Uh, there are lots of different issues that need to be addressed. We've learned a lot from the existing pilots, but most states have not participated in a pilot. And as Dr. Hendren pointed out, the actual participation of people, including in many cases, state legislators, has a, a powerful educational impact, which we are not going to get a national uh, uh, per mile system until we get uh, public support across all 50 states, in, in my view, and that's critically important. Also, institutions, uh, what institutions are going to be needed to play key roles? Departments of motor vehicles, perhaps, uh, the international fuel tax agreement among truckers, there are things that need to be explored uh, in a lot more detail than, than the current pilots have been done. I want to close with one uh, sort of more philosophical point, and that is there seems to be a growing idea that there's a conflict between uh, a well-funded and somewhat expanded highway system and the need to combat climate change. And I want to call your attention to the long-term nature of, of both of these problems. Uh, the transition to electricity is going to proceed at a much faster pace, it appears, given the commitments of auto companies, the federal government, and many state governments. Uh, so, but at the same time, rebuilding the, the interstate highway system is not going to happen overnight. And if some corridors, particularly truck heavy corridors, need more lanes, you're talking about a long term prospect here. Uh, 
maybe 15 years before the first major uh, rebuilding can be completed if, if, the, if the designs were there today, and probably 30 years until the whole system were rebuilt and modernized. So during this time period, we are going to be electrifying transportation. So the idea that we can't, we shouldn't let VMT, vehicle miles of travel, expand uh, because of climate change, I think is a very short-sighted view. Uh, Long-term future is going to require more capacity for trucks. Autonomous vehicles are likely to take market share away from short-haul flying and onto highways. So we need to think all of these problems long-term together. That concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer questions when the time comes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a whole lot, Mr. Paul. You got a lot to uh, to think about here. Our final uh, witness uh, for uh, this morning's panel is uh, Douglas Schenkel. And uh, Mr. Schenkel is the Transportation Program Director within the Environment, Energy, and Transportation Program at the National Conference of State Legislators. Mr. Schenkel, thank you for joining us this morning. You're recognized at this time to present your testimony. Please go ahead. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and distinguished members of the Senate Environment <clears throat> and Public Works Committee, my name is Douglas Schenkel, and I am the Transportation Program Director at the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL. NCSL is the bipartisan organization representing the 50 state legislatures and the legislatures of our nation's commonwealths, territories, possessions, and the District of Columbia. Our mission is to strengthen the institution of the legislatures, provide connections between the states, and serve as the voice of state legislatures and the federal government. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you and the committee for your leadership on the important issue of transportation, funding, and financing, not with just with today's hearing, but also on the, the committee's work on surface transportation reauthorization. As the previous witnesses have mentioned, revenue flowing into the Highway Trust Fund has proven to be insufficient to support surface transportation programs. As such, since this FAST Act, states across the nation have worked to research, develop, and deploy new funding mechanisms to meet their own transportation funding needs. <clears throat> we very much thank Congress for the Surface Transportation System Funding's Alternative Program, STISFA, which was established in the FAST Act, and we do urge Congress to build upon that and support a new user fee formula-based transportation funding mechanism to provide the much needed investment in the nation's transportation infrastructure. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just going over um, some of the most common and notable state transportation revenue options with a focus on user-based revenue sources. I'll, I'll just briefly touch on gas taxes since I think we all have a good sense of how those work and what they look like. I will note since 2013, 30 states and the District of Columbia have enacted legislation to increase gas taxes. Those gas tax increases have ranged from two to 23 cents. Uh, 22 states and uh, the District of Columbia have a variable rate gas tax that adjusts to some degree with an inflation or prices without regular legislative action. Let me talk about electric vehicle fees a little bit because that's something that's certainly on the mind of state legislatures at the moment. Um, that's a that's one widely pol adopted policy approach to address funding shortfalls related to the declining gas tax revenues is to apply a separate additional registration fee for plug-in electric or hybrid vehicles. In fact, 28 states have such a fee for electric vehicles, and of those, 14 states also assess a slightly lower fee on plug-in hybrid vehicles. These fees range from $50 to $225 per year, and the fee revenue is most often directed toward a state transportation fund. However, at least three states allocate some fee revenue to support EV charging. Additionally, at least five states structure the additional registration fees to grow over time by tying them to the consumer price index or another inflation-related metric. Along the same lines, um, states have also been enhancing registration fees for kind of traditional passenger vehicles. Uh, since 2017, at least 12 states have enacted legislation to enhance registration fees for, the, for traditional vehicles. Uh, California and Utah are among states that recently have indexed their registration fee to CPI, so will be increasing um, over time and doesn't necessarily have to be back, go back and be adjusted constantly by the legislature. Um, with the kind of growing ubiquity of uh, transportation network company services such, such as Uber and Lyft, uh, states and, and local governments have been looking at, at how to kind of address the impact of, of, those, um, of those services. At least 11 states and Washington, D.C. have enacted laws creating additional fees for transportation network company rides and fares. 
Well, most of these states use these fees to administer TNC regulatory oversight. At least four states, Georgia, Maryland, Massachusetts, and New York, as well as DC, use some of the fees to in part support transportation projects in their state. Let's talk a little bit about uh, road user charges. Rock, I'm going to refer to it commonly as that. Uh, Dr. Henderson and and Jack and 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 Bob all kind of weighed in on that to a certain extent. Uh, states have been at the forefront of studying road user charging since the early 2000s when Oregon first started looking into it. And many states are currently exploring RUC systems. Uh, many of these efforts have been supported by the federal government via the STISFA grant program, the Surface Transportation System Funding Alternatives. Uh, 14 states have been awarded STISFA grants. Although when you kind of calculate the Eastern Transportation Coalition and then Ruck West, um, the, the reach of the number of states involved in some ways is even is even higher than that. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, there are two operational Ruck programs in the country today. Um, Oregon and, and Utah both have them. Oregon's has been around for a few years, I think since 2016 now. Utah has just started recently. They're both voluntary and both created at the behest of their state legislatures. Oregon's program is open only to only to any to open to any vehicle over 20 miles per gallon, while Utah's is currently open um, only to electric and hybrid vehicles. Um, Ruck's, Virginia's RUC program will go live in the summer of 2022. Oregon, Utah, and soon Virginia will allow drivers of plug-in hybrid and electric vehicles to not pay the full enhanced registration fees if they participate in a state RUC program. Um, there's been a lot of legislative interest in this in 2019 and 2020. At least 19 states considered 34 pieces of legislation addressing RUC. Um, of those seven states enacted eight pieces of legislation. And thus far in 2021, there are 12 states um, considering RUC related legislation. I realize I'm short on time. I just want to quickly talk about public private partnerships. Um, there's been some discussion about kind of access to capital and using the, 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 the free market to kind of um, help build some of these, especially big projects. 38 states, Puerto Rico and DC, statutorily authorized P3s for the transportation sector. Um, state enabling statutes range from project specific to a limited authority based on project size to broad comprehensive frameworks for P3 agreements. The most common type of transportation P3 tends to be toll facility, but P3s don't necessarily equal tolls and tolls don't necessarily equal P3s. In other words, owners of the road, a state DOT or a local government can build a job the old fashioned way or have a private contractor do the design build and then the DOT can charge the tolls themselves. States have undertaken non-toll P3 projects with their private partners, such as build, bundling bridges in Pennsylvania and transit projects in Maryland. Colorado, Louisiana, and Virginia are some of the states known for having a robust P3 state structure and project portfolio. So with that, I wanna wrap up and just say, we applaud Congress for taking this initial step to examine potential methods to ensure sufficient and stable long-term federal transportation funding and encourage continued outreach to states to develop a shared long-term vision for funding and financing surface transportation systems that will enhance the nation's prosperity and quality of life for all Americans. Thank you very much for having me. Mr. Shingle, thank you. And, and thanks to all of our witnesses. I don't know about the rest of our, uh, my colleagues here and uh, joining us virtually. I think this is fascinating stuff. And I'm sitting here uh, uh, thinking about uh, Dwight Eisenhower and his leadership, which got us started on the interstate highway system, transformational for our, our country. And we're on the cusp of another transformational change in the, uh, the way we uh, not just build uh, roads, highways, br bridges, but build back better, also do it in, a, in the face of uh, climate change and do so at, at a time when uh, we're trying to figure out how to pay for this stuff and in ways that make sense and are acceptable uh, politically and just make good uh, common sense economically too. Um, I'm gonna, I, Mary Frances Repco has given me, our staff director has just given me a, a list of names here in order of uh, recognition and this may change a little bit as people pop up virtually. But uh, I'm gonna lead off uh, followed by Senator Capito, Senator Cardin, Senator Inhofe, uh, and if he returns, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Kramer, and Senator uh, Lemon. So I'll, uh, let me just start off if, if, I, if I could. Uh, first question is, where do you agree? Where do our witnesses agree? Pick a, a major point or two where you think there's consensus among the, uh, the witnesses who are here testifying today. And uh, let's tell us, where do you agree? And just be very brief, take a minute, no more than a minute uh, for each of you. Mr. Kyle, where is the consensus? Where is the common ground? Go ahead. The, uh, I think the thing where there's agreement at this point, 
excuse me, is um, that, that there is a shortfall in the trust fund in the coming years. Um, most of my other panelists have spoken of policy choices. Um, they're all representing particular positions. Uh, CBO does not have a particular position on what the, uh, um, what the Congress ought to do. And so I will uh, basically stay silent on other areas of agreement or disagreement. Um, my testimony mostly focused on options for, for you and your colleagues. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Basso, Jack, where, where do you see areas of agreement amongst the five witnesses? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see a minimum of three areas. Number one, the action has to be taken if we're going to be successful in implementing a major and futuristic transportation infrastructure investment program. Secondly, that the gas tax, and you know better than I do the political reasons why we can't just raise the gas tax. We proved that. And that uh, the second point is that uh, two commissions and a lot of other study has suggested that per mile costs and travel uh, as a billing cycle is a way to accomplish this and take into account the changing mix of the fleet. Uh, electric vehicles will become far more prominent in the near future than we would have thought 10 years ago. And I think the last thing is that uh, a national pilot is definitely necessary to, uh, if the federal government's going to engage in this activity, and I think we will, and to accomplish what we can learn and deal with all the kind of attendant issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Basso. Um, Dr. Hendren, where, where do you see the areas of, of agreement consensus amongst the uh, five witnesses, please? So, Chairman, I'm going to go back to your comments and your opening remarks about not compromising on principle. I think what we keep hearing is the need to get back to the user pay principle. And that came up in everyone's comments. And so I would really focus on that as why a big reason why we're here. And the concept of pay for what you use, it resonates. It resonates with the public, it resonates within this room and outside this room. So that is encouraging that we can have this transformational change for the future. And what I see is federal leadership, again, thanks to this committee, to have that grant program that has built momentum. And that momentum has been remarkable in the last four years. But I do think having continued state level work is gonna be important. Again, kind of getting that groundswell of understanding in combination with that federal leadership and a national education campaign about the importance of transportation. That's why we're all here today and the need for change. So that's where I see we really are all lockstep on this topic. Great, thanks Dr. Hendren. Um, Dr. Kyle, where is agreement? Where do you see the consensus please? Um, I, did you mean to call on me? No, I, uh, I have, I've gotten out of, uh, out, of, uh, out of line here. Mr. Poole, yes, thanks, sir. thanks very much. Mr. Poole? There we go. I'm, I'm on now. Yes. yes, you are. Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we all are in agreement, uh, uh, apart from CA, CBO, that we need to replace per gallon fuel taxes with per mile charges in some form or another. Secondly, I think we all agree that we, we need to invest more in our transportation system for sure. Uh, and that the federal government has a continued role to play in, in research and, and, and development on the idea of how do we implement uh, per mile charges in a way that's gonna work and be affordable and politically acceptable. And I think we all agree that the user pays principle is very important. I think I'm the only one that, that stressed users pay, users benefit as the second aspect of that. But uh, I think there's a, there's a remarkable amount of consensus here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. And uh, go ahead, our last uh, witness, Mr. Schenkel, please. Yeah, it's nice when we can all um, agree on this. this is one of the fun things about working at transportation. I would agree. I mean, I think states certainly are aware um, of the, the pressures associated with um, increasing fuel efficiency and more electric vehicles. And so they've been they've been already feeling this and trying to grapple with this. So the, the Highway Trust Fund is in trouble. States realize that and they're looking for new solutions. So it's good that we all acknowledge that there's an issue. I do really agree that user fees are something that NCSL continues to support. And as kind of Bob alluded to, they also lead to a better 
a system and outcomes in terms of you're linking, you know, you're using something with um, that so that, you know, can, can impact, can have positive impacts for congestion and what have you. And then um, continue to engage with the states. This is so appreciated bringing in CSL and all these folks that are, that are doing things out in, in state and regional and local governments and continue to hopefully give states some seed money so we can, uh, states can continue to uh, innovate and try different things and, and try to make sure that we're talking with um, the public because they do really think that any change is really going to need public buy-in clearly. And a lot of times having local and state elected officials that are closer on the ground is a, is a good way to kind of seed those efforts and, and grow trust. And so, yeah, there's a lot of areas of agreement, I think. That's great, Mr. Shingle, thank you. Thanks to, to all of you. I'll just say the National Governors Association has uh, is mass, multifaceted, but one of the entities within the, the NJ is something called the Center for Best Practices. It's a clearinghouse for good ideas. I think of the states as laboratories of democracy. Many of us have held state offices as well, and you know this. And the, uh, we can learn from the states what they're doing well and, and maybe not so well. All right, Senator Capitor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to start out briefly. We've heard a lot about VMTs and a lot of different acronyms that there is, is used, but I think we understand what the concept uh, of that is. But I want to go back to Dr. Kyle just quickly for a uh, clarification question. You mentioned that if if the VMT was put into effect at one cent per mile, it would generate $2.6 billion. But previously you had mentioned that over 10 years, the shortfall is one, $195 billion. So we got a big gap here. I guess my question is uh, back to Mr. Schinkel in some of the um, state's uh, uh, pilot studies is a one cent per mile. Is that a, a, a marker that's been used for success here? Or is that uh, because it's not going to generate enough to hit our shortfall at all? So I, I guess, Mr. Schenk, I want to ask you that about the one cent per mile. But I also want to ask you, there are concerns on privacy. We haven't really heard much um, pushback on that. And maybe those issues have been sort of laid to rest through some of these state um, pilot study. So, Mr. Schinkel, could you address the privacy issue as well? Yes, thank you, Ranking Member Capito. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the the mileage charge, let me look real quick. I believe in Utah, it's 1.5 cents a mile, um, and in Oregon, it is 1.8 cents a mile. So somewhere in that range, most of what the states I've seen talking about, of course, there's only two operational programs. Right actually charging. So that gives you some sense. Most of the range that I've seen is somewhere in that range and um, somewhere in between one, one to two cents. So I would say that's a fairly Please kind not. of um, accurate start, um, starting point. Um, with regards to privacy, I think you, you're definitely absolutely correct that that's going to be one of the big things public um, kind of perception wise to get through is, is, is how to address this. Some of the things states have done, I think are, are really interesting. So maybe a couple examples. So Oregon, when they established their program back in 2013, they did work with the, uh, the ACLU while they were developing that program. And, um, and that helped kind of get some buy-in there. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the public feedback um, that's, that's, that the, the states that are doing the, the RUC programs or pilots has found that the more familiar with the drivers become with, um, the, with the systems, the more they have less of an issue with the privacy concerns. I'm not saying that necessarily addresses all of them. Another piece is, uh, is offering options. That's something that um, California and I would say Washington and some of these states are doing a lot of work on. They've been studying and looking at like 10 different payment options. And some of those are like, for example, there are 15 states that do annual or biannual uh, in-person vehicle inspection, inspections essentially. So in those 15 states, you theoretically could just do an odometer reading very easily within existing state structures and law and just have an odometer reading and you're in and out and there's no um, impact on your privacy. Now, the flip side and the downside of that is that if you travel out of state or you live on a, a large private ranch or you drive a lot of miles on, on, on private roads, you're gonna get charged for those miles. So the, the trade off is that having that location information is always gonna be really helpful to 
ensure that you're being accurately charged and being charged as little as possible, I guess I would say. Some of the other things that states can do is that certainly I know Oregon and California and Utah have all done things around um, kind of de-aggregating the location information. I know in Oregon, they're only allowed to have to keep that um, location data for, for um, 30 days and law enforcement have to have a warrant to access it. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to be done. I think states have taken good steps. Um, I also do think this needs leadership at the you know local, state, and federal level to continue to talk about this and to try and um, talk about the, the challenge that we don't have enough transportation funding. So those are kind of Thank some you. of my thoughts. Thanks Thank for you. the question. Thank you. Thank you for your insight there, um, Mr. Poole. In your statements, uh, or in your um, yeah, in your statement, you mentioned that if all of the money that was generated from the gas tax was put towards the surface transportation bill that it would be much closer to meeting the shortfall. Are you referring to the fact that funds from that uh, gas tax are uh, uh, um, moved over to transit? Is that, is, is that what you were alluding to? Mr. Poole? Uh, yes, I, I, I understand the question. Uh, what I was referring to is uh, the, if you look at the total amount of revenue from the user from highway user taxes going into the trust fund versus the amount spent, um, we're only there's only a two billion dollar a year gap right now, according to CRS, between the uh, spending on highways and the revenue from highway users. All almost all the shortfall is all the non-highway programs. So uh, closing that two billion dollar gap. Uh, would take a very small increase in, in a user tax, uh, which might be more uh, acceptable to highway users if they knew that all the money was that they that they put in was going to be spent to better for better highways, and then the rest could be simply uh, paid for out of the general fund, all the non-highway portions, and that would be my suggestion for a, a short-term fix. It's not going to solve the long-term problem. But it would uh, uh, make the, the trust fund itself, the highway trust fund itself, uh, uh, solvent. Okay, thank you. All righty, Senator Cardin. Senator Cardin, uh, to our witnesses, Senator Cardin serves as the uh, chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee. This committee does a great job. And his wing person, wingman on that is someone who's chaired this committee before, Jim Inha. So they're a good team. Senator Cardin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, thank you. And I, I want to thank all of our witnesses. This panel has been extremely informative. Uh, I sort of share the chairman and ranking members' view that we are looking for revenues that can get bipartisan support and we can move forward uh, as a Congress. And we all recognize we have a shortfall. So I find this panel to be very helpful. Uh, Senator Capito, I, I understand the one cent per mile estimates based upon commercial traffic, which is where the pilots are all headed right now. But as our witnesses have pointed out, if you're looking at replacing the existing gasoline tax, which would give us a lot greater need for revenues, we'd be looking at a broader mileage uh, user fee. Um, and uh, it would uh, create additional issues that have to be resolved before we could get to that point. So. In one respect, we're looking at the mileage-based user fees to get us out of the current hole. But if we're looking at the long-term impact, uh, then we really do need to have uh, other questions answered before we can do that. One is federalism. Uh, how do you impose a national user uh, fee based upon mileage and work with our states as because they use the, the gasoline uh, as a revenue source, and how do we sort of bring this together under federalism and the interstate use of our transportation system? I, I want to uh, sort of challenge on two parts as we move forward, and maybe I'll start with Dr. Hendren on this first, and that is how do you answer the question if we move towards a mileage-based user fee at the national level of low and middle income families being overly burdened? And how do you deal with the fuel efficiency issues, which is one of our major objectives in all of our policies is to increase uh, the efficiencies of our transportation system? Senator, thank you for the question. Make sure my mic is on there. So I think starting with the first one, um, 
about the impact that this potential shift from a fuel tax to a distance-based approach could have on different geographic areas as well as socioeconomic groups is work that still needs to be done. And I think a really important place that we need to start that conversation is where we are today with the fuel tax is a regressive tax. And what we found, for example, in looking at rural communities versus urban and suburban, that a lot of rural communities are paying more um, today under a fuel tax approach. And a shift to a distance-based approach, they would pay slightly less. So we I understand that yep. more work needs to be done. I, I really do understand that. Okay. But we're impatient right now because mm -hmm. we've got to act. So if we're going to act in this Congress to do a transformational improvement in our infrastructure, and we need to have revenues, but we don't want to adversely impact on middle and low income, what do we do? So I think the benefit of a distance-based approach versus a fuel tax is you have more policy levers. So the way you set your rate, I think, is the answer to the question. So you can have one rate that's the same for everyone. We can also look at rates that would vary based on where you live, income level, type of vehicle. There's a lot of options. And again, that's a benefit of this um, kind of more transformational way of funding transportation. So I think that's the way to, to move forward there. And how about on the energy efficiency issues? One of the points that have raised that those who use electric vehicles, yes, they are very much impacting on our, on our uh, transportation system, but they are also a benefit in regards to the impact of, on our environment. So how do we weigh that issue? So I think that um, what we've seen so far is EV owners are actually very willing to be part of a distance-based approach. So if you look at the Oregon program, a volunteer program, almost a third of those volunteers are EV owners. So that shows you the choice to be an EV owner is about the environment. And they do also want to have roads to drive on. So those issues are not at odds with EV. I guess I don't understand a voluntary program. They voluntarily agree to pay money? So you can either pay a registration fee or a, a, a cap amount, or you can do the voluntary program. So if you are an EV owner, you're not going to be paying fuel tax today. So if you opt into the program, you could be paying, you will be paying more. But wouldn't you make the judgment based upon which you think you're paying less money to the government? Wouldn't that be the decision? Exactly. So, so I, I, that doesn't necessarily reward energy efficiency. It doesn't, but I think the reason why I'm bringing that up is it doesn't, there's a concern that moving forward the distance-based approach will hurt the sale of EVs, hurt that transformation of our fleet. And so what we're seeing out there in these demonstration pilots, that's not true in, in the programs. So but if, I'm, if I have, uh, if I want to transfer to an electric vehicle, and I do lots of driving, mm -hmm. but I'm prepared to do that, I'm prepared to charge where I need charging stations, pay for the battery support that I need, how does this system benefit that decision I'm making to help the environment? So the way we have it now is you will be paying, the majority of your operating costs for an EV is that charging. They're, they're not paying for a fuel tax, which is what we've been using to fund our roads and bridges. So if the question is what's the motivation for the EV owner, it is to support the roads and bridges on which they drive. So you are correct if um, they're like, that's not cost effective for me, they could choose not to. But what we're finding is a very openness to be part of the solution, have those roads and bridges to drive on. But I think your point about fuel efficiency, that's where our real um, challenge is right now, as far as the revenue loss from these much more fuel efficient vehicles. And so I look at Virginia's program as a, a real um, example of how to address that revenue loss from fuel efficiency. So we have kind of two issues and they kind of get merged. So I think looking at fuel efficient vehicles and looking at EVs, and this approach can address both of those types. You're of absolutely right. The revenue loss is the environmental gain. <clears throat> you have to weigh it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's really good, uh, good questions. Uh, one of the, uh, the issues that uh, Senator Cardin raised was actually addressed uh, in part in a hearing yesterday. He and I sit next to each other on the Finance Committee as well. He, he finds it hard to get rid of me. But uh, our, witness, our witness just was uh, uh, Commissioner Reddick, the Commissioner for the IRS. And uh, one of the issues that I raised with him is um, for the, the concern uh, on raising uh, well, a gas tax, diesel tax, user fees, if our concern is uh, how do we uh, help make sure that uh, lower income families, at risk families, don't end up uh, you know, bearing an, an inordinate amount of burden. And I asked him to, uh, to for this question for the record, I said, why don't you uh, see if there's some way that we can provide a, uh, through the tax system, a, um, um, a rebate of some kind 
So they would go to families whose maybe whose income is on below the median average in, in the country to help make them whole with some assumptions on how much gas and diesel they're using. So we'll see. Uh, okay, uh, Zin Renhoff, you're up, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm last hearing I entered into the record uh, um, uh, an effort to protect the ban on government controlled interstate uh, rest areas. I know that some of our witnesses, I understand that uh, Mr. Poole uh, probably disagrees with this position, but it's one that we felt pretty strongly about. I want to enter into the record this time. I, it's a similar um, letter. It's signed by stakeholders that we all know, such as the National League of Cities, the National Restaurant Association, the Energy Marketers of America, and a lot of others, which talks about the value of the private sector investment across the nation's um, highway network. And I, I think the rest stops would, have, um, would give the government, if they were government controlled, uh, an unfair monopoly. And so this lesson, this letter, is, is one that covers that. Without thoroughly. objection. And I want to have that as a part of the record. Um, it's kind of interesting, the, uh, the ones, uh, I think he's gone now, but Ben Cardin and I were both elected the same year, 1986. And we've been ha dealing with this, all these highway bills ever since that time. So we have a lot of, a lot of seniority on this issue. And one of the interesting things I always like to point out to my friends and my witnesses at such hearings as this, most of them are too young to remember this, but I remember when the biggest problem we had in the Highway Trust Fund is we had too much surplus. <laughs> and so everyone was trying to rob the surplus. Well, uh, I'm, uh, one of the worst offenders of that was uh, uh, Bill Clinton. And he actually took, I can't remember how many billion dollars was out of that. And it took me about two years to get it all back in, anticipating that we'd have the problems that we're having today. And one of the unique things about this is the, this is a program that everyone agrees with. I can remember a lot of the Republicans that were going to be running for president a few years ago were trying to each one be the most conservative, more conservative. And one of our people went back, actually it was one of the candidates from I shouldn't say this, but from Kentucky. And um, he got up there, and they're, they're, they, all the transportation people jumped all over him. You're running for president here, and, and we don't want, and he said, oh, I wasn't talking about transportation. You see, we're, we're, we have that benefit uh, that, that people all fall into agreement that we want to have that system. So anyway, uh, I was glad. To, this is the first time that I've heard that all of our witnesses came in agreement knowing that there should be a user pay concept. And I've been saying this when it was very unpopular to say this, and now I think it's more popular than it was at that time. So uh, I, I think we're making some, some headway in this area. I'd like to make sure that there's no one here. What we all agree is we do need a long-term highway bill to give the states the fundamental, the, the certainty and the predictability and I would assume if there's any of our five witnesses who don't agree with that, say so now, because I believe that is a concept that we all agree in. And I think also the fact that we are now looking at something on the electrical, uh, electric vehicles, I'm paying their fair share, and I'm just rejoiced in the fact that people are talking about that now, and it is popular, and it is very fair. Um, now, Mr. Schenkel, I understand that nearly 30 states have passed electric vehicle fees to help pay for the roadway. Now, I'd like to have you elaborate a little bit on, have these revenues been used to invest in roads and bridges? Have they been successful? Uh, we're, we're looking at this right now in our state of Oklahoma. And so I'd like to um, explore, have you explore that a little bit on what has been workable uh, in the past. Yeah, thank you for that question, Senator Inhofe. Um, yeah, so it's 28 states have enacted uh, fees on electric vehicles and 14 on uh, hybrid vehicles. Um, that money is, except for three states, that money is pretty much going into transportation uh, projects. Sometimes transportation projects are a little more 
maybe broadly defined too, to include a little bit of electric charging stations and things like that. But, but generally for the most part, that money is going into the state mm -hmm. fund that pays for transportation there. Um, given that no states, I don't believe has more than 2% or I think even at the most of their, of their personal vehicle fleet, that is electric um, vehicles. The amount of money thus far isn't really substantial. Now that's going to start to change and it's going to become more important in the next, I think every year it's going to become more important, frankly, next, especially, but especially within five to 10 years is that kind of bridge until we do figure out if are we moving to Iraq or what are we going to, what are we going to do? But um, the short answer is some way there's not, there's not necessarily a lot of money there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really more of a equity kind of concern at this point that, you know, there's a group of vehicle owners in many cases, which, you know, tend, tend to be, but not always are, are higher income that weren't paying to be part of the system at a time when the system needs more money in. And so that, that was a lot of the, mm -hmm. the rationale behind that. And I'm happy to provide more information on how um, the states have exactly been spending that money um, mm -hmm. in, in the, in the follow-up testimony, but it, but it is mostly for, uh, for state transportation um, projects, maintenance yeah, and operation. And I think and for the you. record, any elaboration on that, you can get, that'd be very helpful to us. I think this hearing has been very, very helpful. Um, the question that we get, one of the differences between witnesses and people sitting at this table is you don't, you guys don't have to run for election. <laughs> and uh, it's so I, the first thing when we hear a, 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 a VMT system or one of these other systems, the first thing that comes to me is the questions that people are always ask. When we talk about this publicly, the only question they have is how much is it going to cost me? Uh, anyone have a good idea and a good answer for that question? No, I didn't think so. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would just say to my, my colleagues, you know, I've talked to a lot of governors and a lot of state legislators, I know you have too, but those who have in the last decade, not in the last five or six years, who supported increases in traditional user fees in their states have actually been more electable rather than less. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I think next is Sheldon. Sheldon, Senator Whitehouse, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses. Um, I want to pick up on the same topic that we've been talking about, which is how um, we get electric vehicles to pay a fair share of the use of the road. Um, but I come at it from a slightly different perspective um, because I've got this consumer reports information here that shows the number of states in which what is charged electric vehicles is higher than what is charged internal combustion engine vehicles. In some cases, it's not a huge difference. It's 40% more, 20% more, 36% more. Uh, but in some cases, it's nearly triple. And um, the expectation of consumer reports is that these are going to continue to trend upwards. Um, with electric vehicles being charged as much as four times what an internal combustion engine vehicle is charged. So I think that as we address this issue, and we address it from an equity point of view, it's going to be important looking at whatever kind of a highway funding program we put in to make sure that this is not being used as a mechanism to suppress the development of electric vehicles. It's hard for me to see a reason why it should be more. I don't know if any witness can identify a manner in which an electric vehicle is harder on the highways and bridges than a internal combustion engine powered vehicle. Um, if these were great big trucks that had extra weight, uh, my governor, who's now the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Governor Raimondo, put an extra toll for trucks coming through Rhode Island, worked out, I mean, the truckers didn't love it, but it worked out pretty well in terms of convenience because of Easy Pass, which makes tolling so uh, easy. And I understood that they do put a lot more wear and tear on the roads than a regular passenger vehicle. But an electric vehicle, I think, is pretty equivalent to an internal combustion engine vehicle in terms of the wear and tear it puts on the roads. So it doesn't make sense to me why 
these states, many of which have significant fossil fuel investment in them and fossil fuel activity in the legislature, would be charging a higher fee against electric vehicles than they do about internal combustion engines unless they were actually trying to suppress electric vehicles so that we could continue to burn more gasoline and continue to pump carbon dioxide into our atmosphere and continue to pollute, and obviously none of that is a very good thing. So I hope that as we try to solve this, um, Mr. Chairman, we'll keep in mind that it really would not be appropriate for states to use this predicament that we have right now to pick winners and losers as between electric and internal combustion engine vehicles. And particularly if the purpose, there's no statement of what the purpose is in any of this, so we'll look into it further, but my surmise would be based on um, the location of the states and the lack of any apparent justification for charging electric vehicle more, um, that this has something to do with trying to suppress the growth of electric vehicles. And I don't think that is a winners and losers contest that we should be in. And it's not a contest that I think we should allow the states to get into um, because of all the other collateral costs of suppressing the growth of electric vehicles. So that's, the, that's what I wanted to uh, mention today. I look forward. We've done highway work in really strong bipartisan fashion before. Um, and I think it really is important that we take care of our roads and bridges and the traditional infrastructure for automobile transport. But I will be extremely concerned about any proposal that we adopt that allows for this kind of uh, selective choosing of winners and losers and um, deliberate suppression of consumer choice towards electric vehicles, uh, particularly if we discover that the fossil fuel industry has had its hand in the politics of any of these places and getting those fees to be jacked up to where it costs more to own an electric vehicle than it does to own an internal combustion engine vehicle. And with that, I'm happy to yield back the rest of my time. Um, I look forward to working with everybody to get a good bipartisan bill going on this and continue to develop our infrastructure. Good. I, I think we all share that view. That's good. You know, one of the things that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Senator White, I said, uh, during the break, one of the things, when one of our sons came home uh, from California, and we just went out and drove all kinds of vehicles. And I will say this, the, uh, those electric vehicles are a lot of fun. They are just a hoot. To a lot of torque and a lot of, he, he, he and I both felt like kids again. He still is. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think uh, next uh, is uh, Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all the witnesses. And I agree with a lot of what's been said, and, and largely over the fact that we are unified in, in the, uh, the goal. Um, the details will kill us eventually, probably. But in the meantime, let's. I, I do think there's a lot of common ground. And certainly, and Mr. Chairman, to your opening statement, I, I remain committed to principle while having an open mind to the policies that will get us where we need to get. And I think we're off to a good start right here. Um, I, I, want, I would like to say, Senator Whitehouse raised an important point, and it's hard to know what any individual or group of states might be doing, and maybe we can get an answer to that in a little bit. But I think a lot of that, though, those fees are, are registration fees, and that when you break it down to the uh, you know, the, the, the use fee, it's probably less, not more. The other thing I would mention uh, in some of the studies I've seen, um, at least to this point, and, and it, the, uh, you know, I think in the California UC Davis study showed that 30% uh, of the people who drive an electric vehicle make over $150,000 a year, and the next 50000 that from $100 to $150,000 a year make up the, another 20%. And so, you know, earlier we were talking about some of the socializing, uh, some, some what I'd call a, a social engineering here with regard to it not hurting people at the lower income level. Well, electric vehicles so part 
so far seem to be driven by people at the higher income level. Uh, I don't know that that's relevant, but I, I think as we're discussing all these things, it's worth noting. Um, also, and I appreciated, I appreciate your, Dr. Your reference earlier and answer, I think it was to Senator Cardin. There is nothing, no tax hardly more regressive than the gas tax itself. So the idea that a user fee for electric vehicles is going to be worse for lower income people than the gas tax is would be hard, I'd be hard pressed to, to see that. I mean, we could design it that way. I would hope we would avoid that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here, I think, probably to, to bring equity to all of the structures. And, and that would be hopefully um, the goal. Um, also, with regard to that, uh, and I want to get to, to some of the things that Senator Cardin was talking about when he talked about um, gas fuel vehicles, obviously gas fuel vehicles emit greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, but nothing in the fuel tax to this point is designed to address any of that. It's not a punitive tax. It may look a punitive sometimes, but there's not a carbon tax added onto it. So when we start talking about, I, I think Ben's... Uh, Party comment was the loss of the gas tax is the environment's gain. While that's true, that, that's a true statement, we're building roads and bridges and maintaining them. We can't do it with less money. We're trying to find a way to get more money in an equitable fashion. And so I just want to make sure we, we make, keep the main thing the main thing when we're talking about transportation infrastructure. And some of the other things being important don't you know, don't get us off the off the rails here. I, I do want to ask Mr. Schinkel a, um, a, a question because we obviously the focus of this hearing is on um, is on the revenue side, but but it also addresses in in the description, of course, um, a, a reference to funding consistency or sustainability or funding uncertainty. In the in the White House's rollout last week, they talked about changing the formula that the the, the uh, press secretary referenced. Um, a, a different formula, a grant formula, uh, ra rather than the, the uh, traditional formula. And Mr. Schinkel, I'd like to know what states might feel about, about a different type of a, a program. J just as an example, the Infra Grant program has existed for over five years, and in my state, we've never received one. Um, and in, in the big, wide open West, I don't want to, pres you know, I don't feel like setting aside 400 miles of uh, gravel to hook up our interstates. I don't think that would serve very well. So um, just a question, Mr. Schinkel, about a, a commitment to funding certainty with by uh, trading the uh, the traditional formula for a competitive bidding process as per the, uh, the press secretary in the White House. Um, I think that I'd have to probably have to be a little bit careful about what I say. I think that I'd have to know more about the exact proposal, but I would say that states are pretty comfortable with the existing formulas that we have that, that are in place to um, transfer money from the highway trust trust fund to the states and anything that would um, kind of deviate from that and reduce the flexibility for states for to be kind of nimble in their states to respond to the infrastructure challenges they have there is something they might be skeptical of. Otherwise, I'm, I'm afraid I can't go into the I can't answer in quite more depth than that, but I could look into that some more with my team and we can get back to you with a more sure. detailed answer. Thank you. As my time has run out, Mr. Chairman, just again, thank you for a very good hearing, a very good start to this discussion, really the second one. And um, I'm keeping my mind open because I think there's a lot of opportunity. And, I, and I, by the way, I think we ought to go big. I really do. I want to aim high. Uh, this is a moment and this is an opportunity. And I think there's an opportunity to do exactly that with these people. Aim high. There's more room up there. Yeah. That's good. I, I said to Adam, who's a, a, a staff director for the a minority, and to Mary Frances, and Rebecca Higgins, uh, I'm very pleased with this hearing. It's, I think, an extraordinary hearing with extraordinary opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I think next uh, next uh, up is uh, Senator Kelly has somehow slipped in here, and uh, we're going to yield to him next, and then Senator Lummis, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hendren. Um, in your testimony, uh, you discussed the importance of taking into account drivers in different geographies when considering options to address the highway trust fund shortfall. In particular, you discuss rural communities where driving far distances is, is often needed for basic necessities like going to work or visiting grocery stores or accessing health care. As a result, Arizonans, state where that I represent, 
uh, living in rural communities often pay for gasoline more often, making them more impacted by a gas tax increase. As Congress considers solutions to fund the Highway Trust Fund, are there any proposals out there which are less costly for residents of rural areas than the gas tax? So, Senator, I think you hit the key point um, directly on target, right which okay. is currently rural communities are paying more in fuel tax, given the distances they need to drive to get their daily live activities done, as well as the vehicles in which they're driving. So I think that's the place we need to start, is exactly your comments. And if we look forward at a transformational way to have a sustainable funding source, the analysis that we have done so far using state data shows that a shift to a distance-based fee will result in slightly less payments for rural communities. So that's a start. So I think how we look and design the rates of that future user-based system need to take into account the different ways people use our roads. And so I think that's an opportunity that we have with this new way going forward. And what kind of research has been done on user-based fees to date? Sure. So what we recently did in several states on the eastern seaboard is we basically took states and we divided them into different communities and how people move. So you have rural communities, you have mixed communities that, are, that look rural but are going into cities, and then you look at what type of vehicles they have, look at how many miles they drive. And then we looked at the today in fuel tax versus tomorrow in a distance-based fee. So doing that data-specific, data-driven analysis has enabled me to go to rural legislatures in North Carolina who are very you know, concerned about this idea for their constituents and say, this is what the data is showing us. I'm a data person, so that's where I like to start, because it starts the conversation. And when you put the numbers in front of people, it makes them say, OK, maybe the way I thought today was isn't exactly as I thought, so let's talk about tomorrow together. So that's the work we started to do. Well, I appreciate you uh, looking and going to the data. You know, that's. Uh Near and dear to my heart. What is it? Um, thank you. Mr. Kyle, I've got a couple more minutes here. I, I want to ask you about uh, how the coronavirus pandemic has affected fuel consumption and gas tax revenues. The Arizona Department of Transportation recently reported that, uh, that year over year, state fuel tax revenues were down 13% in 2020 compared to 2019 which in turn has affected funding for many surface transportation projects in Arizona. Some of this decline was likely due to the initial stay at home orders last spring, but long term telework and virtual schooling have kept drivers off the roads. And I'm concerned that if these trends continue, the stress placed on the highway trust fund could be more significant than expected. So Mr. Kyle, in your testimony, you indicated that it would require about $195 billion, I believe, in general fund revenue to cover the highway trust fund shortfall over the next 10 years. Do those calculations take into account these long-term trends that seem to be out there, uh, which were accelerated by the pandemic, um, more telework, fewer in-person activities, which in turn results in fewer Americans on the roadways? I think the long run effects of uh, the pandemic and uh, perhaps changes in lifestyle that, that might, uh, might occur are still being sorted out. Um, there was a, obviously a reduction of, in driving over the course of the last year relative to, to recent history. Um, I know for the trust fund itself, um, they're still working out exactly the implications of the last year for revenues to that fund, and we'd have to get back to you with um, specifics. We'd be happy to do that. Um, but I believe that that's actually not entirely sorted out by IRS. Um, in terms of longer run trends, it really does uh, depend on what happens to mileage in the future and um, uh, the, the number of vehicle miles in the future, and then also the, the, uh, um, the fuel efficiency or the fuel economy of the vehicles driving those miles. Well, thank you. thank you, Dr. Kyle. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kelly. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Senator Lemus. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a great hearing. Thank you for doing it. Um, Mr. Kyle, we know that not all vehicle miles traveled have the same wear and tear on the roads. Um, we haven't had a cost allocation study since 1997. Can you talk about the type of information that Congress needs to get from a 
more recent study. So the, the cost allocation study is, in fact, quite old, as you, as you noted. Um, I think the, the, the basic points about the cost from past cost allocation studies have been that um, uh, the, the cost of, of passenger vehicles is mostly felt through congestion in, our, in large urban areas and then um, through the environmental externalities from, from gasoline consumption. Um, and for heavy trucks, it's mostly based on, on pavement damage from those trucks. Yeah. Um, I think it would be enormously helpful to the policy community if, if there were a more recent cost allocation study. Thank you. Should there be, and this to Ms. Herndon, should there be some sort of a congestion pricing or some other mechanism that could reflect those differences? Well, whether there should or should not is a, a decision, obviously, for you, you and your colleagues. Um, under, the, under the current system, though, uh, consumers don't uh, basically uh, see the costs of, the, um, of their contributions to congestion. We all sit in congested highways, um, but the uh, um, users are, are, uh, don't, don't bear those costs that they impose on other people. Mm -hmm. Ms. Herndon, have you seen any formula that reflects congestion pricing? So the work that we are doing in our demonstration pilots, we are exploring if this technology of a user-based fee could also be used as a congestion mitigation approach. So the view that we have is our cars are changing. Um, as Senator Carper said, the times are changing, our cars are changing, our drivers are changing. So as we change the way that we potentially fund transportation, what other concerns do we have? So what we've seen so far, we did a proof of concept looking at cordon pricing around a city to say, could the technology of a distance-based fee handle bringing in um, different variable prices on time of day or location? And it looks like the technology can, so we need to do more work there. Again, the idea is how can we simplify how people pay for transportation? How can we look at collecting that revenue in a cost-efficient manner? So we're using the grants, again, that this committee put in place to really kick the tires on this concept. So we have some preliminary findings. I'm happy to um, submit more of our findings when we're finished with them to this committee. But we got a little bit more exploration to do there. Thank you. We'd love to see that. When, you're, when it's available. Uh, Mr. Poole, um, I was really pleased to see you advocated for removing the mass transit account from the Highway Trust Fund in your testimony. Um, is there a user fee model th out there that we could apply to mass transportation so highway users are not subsidizing mass transportation and thereby removing adequate funding from highways and bridges? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the costs of operating and building and operating and maintaining our transportation system are vastly uh, higher than the amount of revenue that gets generated from passenger fees. So the only in the in the research community, one idea that's looked at a lot is something called value capture, real estate value capture. For for example, in a major city like New York. Or, or in Washington, D.C., where you have subway stations uh, trying to, uh, you, you can actually measure that there's significant increases in the land value of being located within, in proximity to those stations. But yet that, uh, that value is captured by the real estate owners, not by the transit system. By contrast, the systems developed and operated in Hong Kong and Tokyo and other major cities in Japan have built in value capture uh, uh, as part of the funding and financing mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, it's, it's, since we haven't done that, and uh, in, in most of these facilities are already are built, it's difficult politically to all of a sudden say, well, you guys have benefited from real estate value increases. Now we're going to take some of it. But that is a, is a mechanism that actually would generate revenue if we could figure out a way to do it. Uh, it's fairly pretty substantial revenue on an ongoing basis. Thank you for that. And uh, for any of you, um, has anyone ever looked at a user fee tax on tires? Uh, I know that there's some tax on tires for uh, commercial vehicles, but what about passenger vehicles? Uh, a, 
a user fee on tires, it could be assessed um, either at the point of sale or um, earlier in the manufacturing process. Uh, that would capture um, electric vehicles as well as gas vehicles. So is, does anyone have a, any information on that kind of a concept? Has anybody studied that? Dr. Cog, any thoughts on that? I think I'm pretty sure there's a federal tax, excess tax on the trucks, uh, large trucks pay on tires. I think, Dr. Dr. Carl, is that true? Yes, there's a, there's a, uh, there is a tax, a uh, federal uh, truck tire tax for commercial vehicles. Um, we have not looked at that for passenger vehicles. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right. Senator Lomas, thanks for those questions. Um, Senator Capito. Thank you. Um, and thank all of you for being here and just, uh, I have a, a, just a, a, co a couple comments and then uh, a quick question. I think it's been really interesting to see how uh, innovative states have been and, and through pilot projects with the, with the uh, road user fees or the mileage-based uh, uh, mileage user fees. And I think that this is something that it seems like we have bipartisan, uh, very large interest in this. And it's, it's something that we ought to really consider as we're, as we're moving forward. And I'm encouraged by that. Uh, I would like to, and I'm, I'm a little puzzled because I think the Secretary of Transportation in his public statements has not only removed the gas tax increase from um, uh, a possible revenue source, but also the vehicle, uh, the vehicle miles traveled uh, idea and concept as, as a, they kind of took that off the table rather rapidly, which I was sort of surprised about. So we'll have to circle back with that. One of the things that I think um, we don't talk enough about, and I'm not really sure, you know, obviously what we're looking here for is uh, enough revenues to meet our needs and, and to meet not just the needs now, but the needs of the future. And so, Mr. Schenkel, you're, you talked about public-private partnerships and that some of that was tolling. We know tolling is very unpopular in a lot of areas of of all of our states and uh, is, is difficult for state leaders to get move forward. What other idea, how else can we bring the private sector into this? Obviously, they're the beneficiary, whether you're a car manufacturer, tire manufacturer, refinery, uh, all kinds of different, uh, you know, um, electrical and, and, and technical parts of an automobile or a truck. How, how else can we bring the private sector dollars into this to help us match our public dollar investment? Do you have any other ideas on that? It's a big question. Mr. Schinkel. Yes, Senator Capito, thanks for that. I do, and I mean, I think along the lines of P3s, and I think it's pretty fair to characterize that public-private partnerships, P3s, are perhaps underutilized in the United States, certainly can compare to um, our comparative Canada, U United Kingdom, Europe, et cetera, um, even Latin American countries. And some of that is kind of a lack of statutory and um, certainty and having kind of the correct process set up. Now, having said that, a lot of states have done a lot of great things with regards to P3s, and they've been successful with a lot of projects and delivering projects that have been on time and for less money and with all the kind of efficiencies and intellectual and kind of physical capital that that the free market and companies have that a state DOT or a state doesn't necessarily have. So I do really think there is a role there for um, private companies to play in some way. Um, I think that the, and you know, you probably asking someone from industry is the way to get the best answer, but they need some more regulatory and statutory certainty. They need um, some idea that if we submit a bid and it goes through and it's accepted, then this project's going to go forward. But as you, you know, alluded to, especially when it comes to tolling, that starts getting really difficult. Um, it, you have to make sure that you have the public buy-in or else you're going to have this conflation of tolls constantly with P3s. Um, and that makes it difficult. Now, having said that, there are examples of where you can do P3s. You can have a large project. Like I think a good example is in Pennsylvania, they're doing 500 plus bridges, um, smaller bridges, and they bundle them together and you bundle a bunch of similar-ish projects together. Um, and by doing that, you achieve this scale. Um, and that doesn't involve any any tools. It's just that, you know, it's it's easier for a private company perhaps to 
um, replace, repair those 500 some bridges than to have the state DOT do it and they can do it quicker and more efficient, efficiently and you have them bid. Um, and they and I believe in Pennsylvania, they're using uh, money from their bonding to pay for that for that. So mm -hmm. that's a an example of a P3 without a toll. Um, there's other examples out there. There's transit P3s, and a lot of these are just based on availability payments, which essentially means that you did the job correctly, um, the, the asset is working correctly, and you're meet, meeting these certain metrics. So I think there is a lot there. Um, I think along the lines of what Mr. Poole said too about, and this isn't necessarily about um, private, but having just access to capital too, and right. things like TIFIA, and having access to capital is important to states, especially for some of these trickier projects. So those are kind of some of my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that you're uh, alluding to here, which is a little off topic for what we're what we're doing here, but regulatory certainty and efficiency in the regulatory processes has got to be a part of this bill. I think that uh, we reached cons some consensus on that in our last bill two years ago that we passed unanimously out of this committee, but that would certainly help us uh, as we move forward. I would say anecdotally, uh, the state of West Virginia uses something called Garvey bonds, and don't ask me what they stand for, but uh, what they are are basically using future revenues, guarantees of future revenues to pay for the highway of the construction of the highway of today. And that's where we have to give this long-term um, certainty to our, uh, to our governors and to our road builders and to our users that in five years you're going to have this amount of money so you can then sort of pre-fund as you move forward on uh, anticipation of funds coming in later. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Biddy is uh, trying to do uh, double duties at two hearings. He's in line to ask questions at both of them at the same time. So he's at, uh, asking questions at another hearing, and when he wraps up there, he's going to join us virtually. In the meantime, I'd like to ask a question of Dr. Kyle, and uh, I want to give you uh, an opportunity, the opportunity to discuss the estimate of uh, revenues that a one-cent VMT fee would raise compared to the annual shortfall in the Highway Trust Fund in response to the question that was raised, I think, earlier, by, I believe it was by Senator Capito. Dr. Kyle. The, so one of the options that you have is to uh, assess a vehicle mile travel tax. Um, and I think that was um, the, the, let me just looking at the state, stage setting for the moment, the, the shortfall in the trust fund over uh, the next 10 years is $195 billion. That's a 10 year number. Um, the, the illustrative number on vehicle mile travel taxes was, um, is $1.6 billion a year. And that's for a VMT tax that would be imposed on commercial trucks on all roads, all commercial trucks. Um, and that's strictly an example, both in terms of the base of, uh, excuse me there, in terms of the base of the tax, the number of vehicles that would be um, taxed, as well as the amount. All of those are choice variables for, um, for the Congress, if, if you go down that road. Um, and maybe the only other thing I would say about VMT taxes is um, that implementing them would take a fair bit of work relative to um, to what we currently have. There's, there's a lot of implementation details that would need to be worked out. Okay, thanks. Uh, a couple of comments I, I might um, make while we're waiting for uh, Senator Padilla to join us. Uh, I uh, oftentimes, as my colleagues and I oftentimes come to work on the train, a guy named Biden, he and I used to train pool together. And even every now and then he still takes a train. Uh, the um, uh, the, the folks, uh, I want to back up, uh, I used to be on the Amtrak board when I was governor. I served on the Amtrak board for four years. And um, we never seemed to be able to um, raise at the fear box for, um, for Amtrak uh, money to pay both for operating costs and, um, and capital costs in the Northeast Corridor. And I might have, uh, maybe mistaken this, but I don't think I am. March uh, a year ago, just before we fell into the pandemic that day, the February or March, may have been the first uh, month uh, since Amtrak was created in the 1970s, where at the fare box, they were able to pay for, because of ridership growth, they were able to pay for the um, operating costs in Northeast Quarter, and I believe the capital costs as well. The ridership was about a quarter of a million people per week, and that was an all-time all-time record. The, the idea of uh, saying that, um, 
we're not going to use any money. And we don't use money, as, as I recall, we don't use money out of the uh, driving the cars in the Northwest Corridor. We would have to build a bunch of extra lanes of uh, I-95. So there's, a, there's a, an argument for, for both sides, and I'll just leave that uh, where, where it is. Um, the, um, I want to ask our witnesses, any final quick po points that you all want to make? And uh, Dr. Carl, any last a quick closing word? Maybe a question you were not asked that you want to answer. Dr. Kyle, real quickly. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to answer anything that you have, but I think I covered the main points that I intended to cover in my, in my role statement. All right, thanks a lot. Um, Jack Basso, Jack, thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Basso. We might call Jack for years. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I think just one point that we really do need to address getting both state and national pilots going, and we're going to need additional funding, which I know you have in the EPW bill. So that's my only additive comment. We really need to move. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Hendren, please. So Maybe one last uh, point you'd like to make or sure. remake. So I think the, um, the topic that hasn't come up as much today um, relates to motor carriers. And I think, uh, again, as heavy users and payers of our transportation system, we really need to look at um, our trucking industry separately from our passenger vehicles as we go forward on a sustainable transportation funding approach. So you all are very aware how diverse and complex and heavy regu heavily regulated the trucking industry is. I think the coalition, we've done a, a very, um, very good job of bringing them to the table, to the conversation. But I'm concerned if we move forward with a user-based approach, it does need to address all users versus singling out um, one of our users on the road. So that comment I just wanted to make sure I had made it clearly. Yeah, I appreciate you making that point. And the, uh, the conversations we've had with the trucking industry, uh, there's, uh, there's great willingness to pay their fair share. There's, there's some of the uh, strongest supporters for making sure that the users pay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Poole, Robert Poole. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I'd like to uh, second the uh, the comment from Dr. Hendren uh, and caution very seriously against singling out the trucking industry to be the place to start. It's really, as, as uh, their findings have found, it's more complex in a lot of ways than passenger cars. And the trucking industry, while participating commendably in, in some of these new pilot programs, has also just published a big report uh, making the most pessimistic possible assumptions about a a, a, a truck mileage based user about mileage based user fees in general, and I think so. There's a lot of persuading still need uh, and experience needed with the trucking industry. The worst thing that policy could do is to single them out and start. We're going to make the trucking industry go first uh, because that would create a backlash that I think would be very very damaging. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, Mr. Schinkel, and then I'm going to recognize Senator Padilla on WebEx. Uh, Sen uh, Mr. Schinkel, please. Thank you, Chairman Carper. Um, two things, I guess I would just reiterate that um, states do appreciate um, having formulas for funding certainty. Um, so that's one thing to mention. And then I think just continue to partner and and ask for the states to participate. This conversation is great. Um, there's a lot of incredible insights that are coming from the surface transportation system funding alternatives uh, grant program, a lot of different things in states. And I think it does work to the advantage of us as a country at, the, at this point that states are kind of experimenting with slightly different ways to do things, working with the public, looking at different payment options and just playing around with what a ruck might look like as well as collaborating with their neighboring states to figure out about um, uh, travel going to, uh, across states. So just continuing to partner with states and, and even more robust funding for CISFA would be nice and just, and, and I think that's all I would say. All right, thanks Mr. Schenkel. Now let me recognize Senator Padilla. Senator Padilla, thanks for hanging in here to join us. You might be last, uh, your last uh, 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 Senator to ask a question. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will try to be brief. I know it's been a long, very substantive hearing. Just to appreciate an opportunity to raise a couple of points. Uh, the first for Mr. Kyle. Uh, Mr. Kyle, in your written testimony, uh, you heeded how a uh, road charge system could create a greater burden relative to income for lower income households. Uh, so what are some ways that Congress could address uh, concerns of uh, equity uh, in uh, in exploring these uh, alternative funding uh, uh, mechanisms and formulas. And I would welcome Dr. Hendren's thoughts on the same matter. 
So, so you're correct to note that um, a road use charge that was uh, was uniform would would impose larger costs um, uh, relative to income on lower income households. Um, in that way, uh, the the characteristics of that I think are probably similar to the characteristics of um, of the gasoline tax. Um, a, as for options, um, that's really something that that I would need to um, to leave to you and your colleagues for uh, for ways to uh, ameliorate the effects of that on the on um, low income households. So to um, add on to my colleagues statements there. I think the key part is today the fuel tax approach is a regressive tax, as you're aware. And so as we move forward, we do have the opportunity with a user-based fee to change how we fund transportation and to be smarter about that. So I think it's an incredible opportunity that's kind of at our feet that we can um, grab hold of. And we can make sure that we go forward in a way that doesn't put a higher percentage of household cost on uh, our lower income households for transportation. Okay. So transportation to me is a, how we create opportunity in our country. So how can we make sure how we pay for it um, continues to open up those doors of opportunity? Uh, thank you both. A uh, lot of work to do to uh, address that. Uh, uh, next and final question is for Mr. Schinkel. Uh, in your written testimony, you noted how the Surface Transportation System Funding Alternatives Program has helped 14 states to explore road usage charge systems. Additionally, 12 states have introduced legislation related to road usage charge so far this year. In addition to funding, how else can the federal government best support states as they continue their critical work to study and pilot road usage charge programs and uh, similar concepts? Well, that's a great question. I think, first of all, having a hearing, and thank you very much, Senator Padilla, for the question. I think, first of all, just holding hearings like this and including the voices of, of stakeholders from the states, I think it would be great to hear from, obviously, Dr. Hendren is here representing the Eastern Transportation Coalition, but perhaps hearing from Oregon and Utah, the states that have the actual operational rec programs, and then your uh, home state of, of California is doing a lot of really incredible and interesting research and has been really piloting and looking at a lot of different payment options, which I think will be important to consider. Um, Washington's doing a lot of interesting stuff. Hawaii was alluded to before. So maybe hearing from some of those states would be another advantageous thing to hear a little bit more about exactly what they're doing, because they can really get into the weeds of exactly what they're doing and, and what kind of systems they're trying, RUC systems they're trying to potentially build. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, thank you for a response. A lot, of, a lot more work to do, a lot more uh, data to gather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Padilla. Well, I think while you were uh, trying to do double duty with the uh, the other hearing you're participating in, I, I mentioned that the states are laboratories of democracy, and uh, they gave us the opportunity to find out what works and do more of that, and frankly, find out what doesn't work and do uh, maybe less of, 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 of that. Uh, I think uh, anybody else, uh, any of our other uh, colleagues uh, out there on WebEx or virtually somewhere would like to participate? Okay. Uh, I, uh, I want to, uh, again, thank uh, our witnesses. Uh, uh, we have both, both sides, both minority and majority side of our, of our Ireland staffs uh, were uh, uh, re responsible for putting together our witness list today. And I just want to say I think you all had a home run with a home run with runners on base. And we thank each of you for, for, for testifying. Uh, almost every day, uh, every week at least, when I'm uh, on the platform waiting to catch the train to, to come down here to go to work, uh, somebody will say to me, uh, I wouldn't want your job for all the tea in China. As I, say, I say that. And I say, really? And I say, yeah. And I said, actually, yeah, I feel lucky uh, to do what I do. And if you think about the opportunities before us here on this committee, we had the opportunity to provide leadership for the Senate and I think for the Congress. Uh, and uh, dealing with some of our toughest challenges. One is this pandemic, how to get out of it, how to uh, get our health better, and to, to, uh, to get through, uh, through, through this rehab. We face uh, the challenge of an economy, the worst economy we've had since the Great uh, Depression. I think it's getting better, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, we have a transport service transportation system that's in bad shape. And we, we, we can do better than this, and we, we need to, to do better than, than this. And uh, we can actually sort of address all of those. And climate change, terrible adverse weather, extreme weather, that uh, 
is uh, not getting a whole lot better for us. It's getting a lot worse over time. So we have the opportunity to address so all of those, all of those. And uh, not all the responsibility lies in this committee, but a good deal. And we have the opportunity, again, to provide uh, some of the leadership that's, that's needed. Our tradition in this committee is to work across the aisle to work together. And uh, we do that pretty well. And we'll have the opportunity to demonstrate that next week when our water infrastructure legislation is before the full Senate. Reported unanimously out of this committee last month, and we hope uh, it'll move along nicely. And uh, we're uh, going to take uh, a, a fair amount of additional input uh, in the hearings uh, and uh, just informal conversations over the next month uh, and a half. And hopefully before Memorial Day, we'll report out a service transportation bill that we'll do it unanimously and uh, in a way that will help make sure that we uh, fund um, fund the uh, the uh, development of our um, improvement of our service transportation system in a sustainable way and with sort of design of kind of resilience that we need and provide for beginning the building the infrastructure and a kind of infrastructure that a lot of us are calling for including our president to build corridors of charging stations and fueling stations because uh, those vehicles are coming uh, I'll close with the words of Mary Barra from about a year ago, CEO of, um, not even a year ago, just maybe uh, three or four months ago, when we were talking about the future electric vehicles. And she said to me, uh, I'm all in on electric. She said, that's where the future is. She said, we've done about as much as we can to improve uh, the internal combustion engine, and we're not going to be able to take a whole lot more. The future is with electric. And I would hasten to add, that it's not just a, a electric with batteries, but I think the, the idea of, of uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, and doing it in conjunction with uh, uh, fuel cells and creating electricity and wa water as a waste product. There's great, uh, great, uh, great future in that and a lot of hope and uh, jobs that can be created from it, uh, not just in building the corridors, but actually building the vehicles that will use those corridors and reduce the threat of climate change to our, our country and to our planet. So uh, I... Uh, I love to quote, quote uh, Albert Einstein, and my favorite Einstein is in diversity lies opportunity. Lots of diversity here, but also plenty of opportunity. And I, another, since we're talking a lot about uh, cars, I look, I just re recall a, a quote from Henry Ford, who was the father of the Model T. And Henry Ford uh, used to say, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. He said, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. I think we can. And I'm really encouraged by the input we've received from our witnesses uh, today. And uh, I very much uh, appreciate the work of our staff in bringing us together today for all of our colleagues who have uh, participated uh, today. Uh, this is, uh, for me, encouraging, and I hope for others as well. I've got a couple of uh, unanimous consent requests. Can't leave here uh, without asking. Unanimous consent to submit for the record a report on the economic impact of public transportation infrastructure, investments rather, from the Amer American Public Transportation Association. The report describes the way that transit benefits both transit users as well as road users who benefit from reduced traffic congestion and traffic safety benefits. I've actually alluded to this already, but this, I make a unanimous consent uh, request as well. And also, I ask unanimous consent to submit a letter signed by 31 transportation stakeholder organizations on the need for a long-term solution to keep the Highway Trust Fund solvent and in support of inclusion of nationwide program uh, to test out vehicle miles uh, travel, the MTVs, in our next bill. And additionally, several other associations and states that have led pilot programs have shared letters of support and findings from their work. And I ask unanimous consent to submit those materials as well. Let me just turn to my right. Adam, anything else? We're good to go? Good, Mary Frances Repco, Majority Staff Director. Oh, yes, here we go. Thank you, Mary Frances. Okay, for some final housekeeping, senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on April 28th. We'll compile those questions, send them to our uh, witnesses. We'd ask for you to respond to them by May 12th, if, uh, if at all possible. And... Uh, Anything else? All right, I think we're good to go. Thanks, everyone. It's a great hearing. And it's time to vote. Thanks. <laughs>